I will say pretty cut. It's the highest area of tenant disputes. There may be some other things about noise violations. Parking is probably a close number two, but CAM is one of the biggest tenant issues. And it's also the most variable cost. And so maybe that's why it prompts a lot of it is it's very hard to predict. And as a landlord, if you're running this, either you're self-managing your property, or if you're going through a third-party manager, they're going to be telling you about letters that they receive from tenants complaining about CAM. Where do the disputes come from? What's the legal basis of them? And what's kind of best practices to mitigate or head off these disputes ahead of time? Ronald Rody Law, we help investors buy commercial real estate to build wealth. That's the tagline. Common area maintenance. I, I, I'm going to start with these kind of three main categories. Uh, billing discrepancies. This covers, this, this encapsulates the expense calculation Again, I think it's really common for flex business parks. So think about if you have multiple buildings on a location and you have shared driveways, you may have shared water detention pond. The, the difficulty or the challenge is how do you allocate expenses between two buildings that are not equal size? Uh, maybe they have different uh Suite build outs. So, you know, I'm talking one building may have all 1,500 square foot suites. And then your second building in the back has two 5,000 square foot suites. Is it fair to say that you're just going to go straight pro rata based on the square footage? That's probably the easiest. And that's, that's kind of logical to me, but it may not make sense depending on the users and specifically what they're doing in the space and consuming common area resources that it might bother certain tenants if they feel rightly or wrongly, they're paying more than their fair share. And that's, that's where a lot of this um, stems from. If a tenant feels like they're getting good value for the money and they feel like they're they're in a good business park, I don't think you have these. You, you, you get a lot of these disputes where they feel like I'm paying all this money, $480 a month, and the trash can is overflowing. I'm paying 500 bucks for cam and the parking lot has a pothole in it. That's the situation where they, the tenants tend to look for uh, discounts or they may hire a contingency firm or they may uh, do a self audit. Uh, they may have audit rights. So how you allocate them should just be in the lease. And you guys have the additional challenge of that if you're doing development and if you're doing a phase development, how do you reconcile or how do you put it in the lease so that, okay, I finished building one, my tenant's you know, just using that 1500 square foot, um, I don't know what I had, 10, 10 units in a 10,000 square foot building, you're 10% of the total space. What happens when you're building a second building and it's 16,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet? At what point do you switch over the, the allocation to being 10% to 5%? Because let's say this is a double of a building. And you could probably tell me, well, Ron, I'm, I'm happy to reduce their percentage share once the other building is occupied. And I'll say, yeah, no, that's great for the landlord, but that's not necessarily common or what is agreed upon in most leases for, uh, for your existing tenants. And the reason is that once that building is finished, those CAM costs really should be allocated to the landlord. I mean, you know, the property tax people, they don't care. Uh, insurance, your insurance costs go up once the building's up. And so even if a building is vacant, the landlord has to pay those proportionate shares. So again, following my example, if you have 50% occupancy, those tenants still only pay 10% of the total CAM. They don't pay, I don't know what it'd be, 25% or 20% just because there's only five tenants. You don't divvy it up based on occupancy. You based it on what the percentage is of the total. And so if you're building a phase two, you're building a phase three and four, at what point do those buildings quote come online and start having full carry costs? And it's it can be you know kind of a contentious issue that people reasonably say, okay, your buildings are done. You should be paying their overhead, not us. 
um, because we've had to put up with all the construction trucks and that sort of thing. So again, just, just having a policy about understanding when you as a landlord have to start paying for vacancy on your new buildings, that's that's going to be very useful. Uh, the next topic is repairs versus capital improvements. A uh, huge, huge issue in that when you send a budget or if you send a CAM reconciliation statement at the end of the year, which basically just lists your, your expenses, it's not a future budget, but it's a retrospective looking at it. Um, they're going to have line items that if you're not careful in how you describe the nature of the work, people are going to say, nope, you shouldn't charge me back. That, that's a capital improvement. And the difference is, uh, is I'm going to specify, this is a legal difference versus an IRS or tax deduction uh, difference. So those are two separate worlds. You have legal definitions, which is defined in the lease and, and is very clear and what you can and can't charge back. The IRS has its own rules and accounting has its own rules about what is considered a repair and deductible as an expense in that year that it was performed or what's a capital improvement that should be amortized over its useful life. Just so you guys understand, those are two very different definitions and don't let either party um, try to try to drag you into either camp. So what do I mean by repairs? I'll use the parking lot example. The cost to restripe, uh, okay, restriping is a bad one. The cost to uh, fill in a single pothole with just some, you know, quick creep, the kind of asphalt patch, uh, maybe put some sealant around it and, and flatten it out and call it a day. That's a repair. If that costs you $500, you add it to your expense, you deduct it from your net income that year, and then you could charge it back as a repair. However, if it is a cutting out of you know 400 square feet and, and ripping out all the asphalt, uh, going back down and, and, and retamping the ground and then putting brand new smooth asphalt. That's a capital improvement. And what is the difference between a one foot one by square one by one square foot repair versus 400 square feet? I don't know where that line is. It just is a feeling of does it feel like you're replacing? Or are you just fixing something? Um, and this is, a, again, a huge area of repair where they're going to see it and they say, that wasn't a repair. You spent money uh, fixing it that will, or replacing something that will improve the, your real property for a longer period of time. Um, and, but it's not just a year. You know, The repair doesn't necessarily have to be designed to last only for a year or even during the lease term. That's independent. I mean, that that maybe factors into whether it's considered a repair or not, but it is certainly not indicative. And you can do repairs that are billed to the tenants that last multiple years. Um, so it's same thing for the roof. If the gutter gets hit by a tree branch and is hanging off, when you send the guy out and he says, well, this section is, is permanently damaged, I'm going to replace a section, that's a repair until he says, well, we got to do another eight feet. We got to do another 40 feet on this side. We're going to replace two downspouts. That looks starts to look like a capital improvement. And so just understanding how you categorize these things internally from your accounting perspective, uh, what the invoice looks like from your vendor, that's what's really going to drive how these are viewed by the tenants and whether they are properly uh, reimbursed from the tenants as repairs versus capital improvements. Now, the best leases that I do have loads and loads of examples because everything that I've just talked about is not new. And you could make a list of everything that you could do that to your building, to the roof, to the parking lot, uh, to the walls, to the doors, to the windows, all foundation, electric, I mean, all of these things, right? Just think about the full uh, detail of what you're building. And you could list out what is considered a repair and what is considered a capital improvement. And some of the best leases that I have, they have very long sections where they detail this out. And it really helps to avoid, hopefully, a future dispute um, because the the nature of a job is not clear to me whether it's a repair or capital improvement. Um, and that's for co common areas. On the same token, you may have repairs that the tenant is required to fix. And he may say, I don't have to repair that. That's a capital improvement. That part of the building has failed. It has exceeded its useful life. You have to 
replace it as a capital improvement. And it can lead to a lot of disputes and lead to, you know, threats of default and that sort of thing until people work it out. Um, HVAC is a big one. And I think to some degree, you guys are going to mitigate that because you have brand new buildings. And I think that you are going to have a lot of stuff under warranty and, and, and it's going to be uh, fewer repairs than buying an existing building. But that doesn't mean you should negate thinking about these terms in your lease when you sign your lease, because any buyer that comes in, they're going to look at your lease and they're going to make a decision. Is this a good lease or is this so-so or not a good lease? And so they do value your building based on the quality of the leases. So spending some time and attention on repairs versus capital improvements is huge. Um, you know, finally alterations and improvements. So I see a lot of this where people want to do repairs <clears throat> or again, alterations. So not necessarily something was broken, but they want to change something. They want to install a shelf. They want to install a tool holder, a hose reel, all this. Sort of, and they do it without permission. And the, the issue is not so much doing it without permission. It's when it causes something else to fail. Um, you, you as a landlord get pretty mad. So you do want to have a tight control because I'll tell you, most of these tenants are not sophisticated and they're going to do things like shoot a, a four inch lag bolt just straight into the wall. And, and if they hit a plumbing line, they're just going to be like, oh my gosh, oops, sorry. You know, I, I, I never would have thought of that. And you're like, really? You wouldn't think that a wall next to the toilet could have water in it and high, you know, pressure water. And they say, well, you know, I didn't think of it. So that's the kind of thing you just want to stay on top of and make sure you're clear to them. Like, don't touch my walls. Don't penetrate the surface. You can't do that without permission because I know where all of the electrical lines are. I know where the plumbing is. And if you want to install something, you got to make sure you do it on a wall where there's no dangerous items hidden behind the drywall. Um, but that does lead to a lot of disputes. And so just having that conversation ahead of time is cute. Uh, proactive measures for preventing disputes. Again, clear lease terms, um, having frequent communication. And I, I, I think I put this in here, but it's, it's really important to walk your units, um, especially when you have people that don't have as much experience maybe with the terms of the lease is I really recommend you have your property manager walk through and, and just you know, I don't say make an excuse, but just give them notice and say, hey, we want to walk through. We, we need to check something, the vents in the back of the unit. Okay. So then you can walk front to back. And this is just for them to put their eyes on the inside of the building. So if you can see, oh my gosh, they've got a ton of heavy equipment hanging off the ceiling, or they have stuff hanging off of the walls that exceeds your weight limits. There's all sorts of things. I, I can't really go through how much, but if you, if you do two things, right, if you actually walk through the units and you create an expectation from the tenants that you do walk through the units, you're going to avoid problems in the first place because they know they can't get away with something because you're, you're an active landlord or a property manager that's going to come and walk the units and they're going to get caught. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and they know when they're doing something they're not technically allowed to do, but maybe they'll push the envelope. And so it's your job as a landlord to show them that you are a active, diligent, and aware landlord. I don't know what it is, but it's the opposite of an out-of-state landlord. You don't want to be an absentee landlord, but you want to communicate to the tenants and show them with your actions that you are an active um, local landlord, whether that's property management or otherwise, you want to be an active landlord. Um, clear and comprehensive leases. Again, detailing CAM, one of the biggest tricks that we do is we really shorten the period that they have to dispute the charges. And what I mean by that is some tenants will say that once you give us the reconciliation or you send us the summary of what our next year's CAM estimate is going to be, we have something like 180 days or 120 days to digest the information, to look at the expense report and, and to decide whether we really want to mount a uh, protest or argues, contest some of that. If you make a very short window for them to review it, these guys are all busy. They don't they don't prioritize this. It's not a huge amount of money, um, not like the base rent amounts, for example. But if you can shorten that something like 15 days or 30 days, nine times out of 10, they may see something, they may have a dispute, they want to get it to a third-party CPA, 
But if they've missed the window to dispute, it's a procedural protection. And you say, oh, sorry, you know, I may agree with you, but you've lost your right to protest because you didn't submit a notice within that time period. And so again, I mean, I, don't, I think 10 days would maybe be the absolute shortest, uh, but 15 days, I see that 30 days, very, very common. And so that's just shortening their window that they've got to get on it and they've got to be really proactive to dispute any CAM obligation. So it's a little bit of a procedural trick, but it makes them uh, be very diligent. Um, finally, successful CAM. CAM also turns into kind of a cluster for even the best landlords, uh, especially when you've got multiple buildings, uh, varying degrees of reimbursement from the tenants. So one of the things that we look at is uh, what is the percentage recovery of CAM? And for example, you may bill $10,000. If you had a 100% recovery, you would receive back $10,000. It's not always that case, and, and I guarantee for these types of flex, it's not going to be 100, but you might be at 98%. So that, that's pretty good. I mean, that means you collected $9,800 out of 10,000. You, you probably want to shoot for something in the upper 90s uh, because your, your cam is going to be a lot more than $10,000, but you want to shoot for something in the upper 90s and just know that it might not be 100. And so if that number starts to slip and you really got to figure out why, are people not paying this? Are they disputing it? Are they delaying? Um, what's what's the reason? And um, you can do some internal audits and check your accounting systems to just to make sure you want to track where that slippage is. Uh, okay, so Zach asked the question, 90%. 90% of the total landlord reimbursable expenses. So anything that comes out of the landlord's account for repairs or CAM, you aim to recover 100%. But practically speaking, you're not going to recover 100 So you want to shoot for upper 90s and 90% you know, I think honestly, ninety percent would be kind of low. Um, that would be kind of a little bit of a sign of of distress or or something to be concerned about. Let's see. Um, how do you resolve this, right? So they they're going to send their written document. Um, okay, Zach says, are we paying these expenses and then being reimbursed? Yes, um, you you can pay the expenses and be reimbursed, but you also have an estimate. So in the beginning of the year or when you sign a lease, they'll be paying an estimated CAM. And then at the end of the year, you'll reconcile. Um, so depending on how close you are to your estimates, that will determine how much you're supposed to collect from the tenants after, after call it like the first of the year, or usually it's like uh, maybe Feb 1. Um, but yes, the, ultimately the landlord is fronting expenses and then being reimbursed by the tenants, whether that's an estimated reimbursement or it's an actual reimbursement. Uh, so so let's do say, they do they just have like an auto amount that they're supposed to be putting in an account? I'm sorry, I just yeah, I, I no, that's think fine. that's important. So there, are they going to be auto depositing an amount? They, they were they supposed to be? Am I like I don't mm -hmm. understand how so you the can lease, make the sure lease that they are. The lease structure is broken into two components. You have something called base rent and you have additional rent. The additional rent is comprised of real property taxes, your ad valorem taxes, your insurance premiums, and then finally is OPEX or CAM, that's the operating expenses of the property or common area maintenance costs. And so those three pieces are part of a monthly payment that every tenant has to pay each month base rent plus triple nets. And that's, that's, I mean, that's where the triple nets come in, but we call it like additional rent. So base rent plus additional rent, and then additional rent is comprised of those three main pillars or sources. Uh, taxes, you know, that's kind of self-explanatory. Insurance premiums, again, it is self-explanatory, but the, the policies that you buy can, can vary. And the prices obviously can vary drastically from year to year, not as much as uh, property taxes. But um, the CAM is is a budgeted amount for the year, and then you can reconcile that afterwards. But ultimately, the, the tenant should know what they're paying for CAM when they sign the lease or the additional rent. Okay. Um, 
So what, what, what do you do when they send a dispute notice? Um, you can do mediation. It, this is, I guess, pretty extreme. Um, I think just frequent communication and just having a procedure in place that I think answers their questions. You know, a lot of the disputes are not necessarily disagreements. They just are unsure or they don't know. Um, so I think, you know, this, this is a pretty extreme example. And you're probably not going to see this very often unless you have some single tenants that are, are bigger and the amounts in controversy are, you know, probably at least $20,000. Um, anything else, it's, it's just not worth it to hire. But mediation, arbitration, litigation, those are just three different ways that you may have lawsuits or disputes that are resolved um, regarding CAM. And, and <clears throat> do people file lawsuits over CAM? Absolutely. Yes. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to attack it, but absolutely people file lawsuits. They go to court and it just is a function of the size of the space and the amount, but you guys are an advantage, you know, smaller spaces, smaller tenants, a lot of them are not going to be filing lawsuits against you for this cam. Uh, all right, guys. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, have a great evening. I'm, I'm signing off.